I'm very honored to uh, welcome here uh, on my channel, Professor Arne Johan Wettlesen, uh, a man who uh, uh, by some has been labeled the most important current philosopher in Norway. Is that correct? Which would probably make you the most important current philosopher in Scandinavia, I would, I would imagine. Um, <laughs> and uh, Wettlesen has uh, worked on a number of different topics like uh, ethical philosophy and the problem of evil. But, uh, but in this case here, what's important in, in the context of, uh, of this channel here, uh, he has worked on panpsychism, which could be seen as a kind of philosophical angle on animism, perhaps animism without practice. I think I would ask you a little bit more about the practice element later, because I find that to be actually hugely important. Um, and uh, in his book that can very much be recommended here. Uh, Cosmologies of the Anthropocene. Uh, Vettelsen is applying this panpsychist thinking in uh, trying to understand the, the times that we live in, particularly in relation to the uh, ecological uh, biodiversity and climactic uh, collapse. Um, so he's a philosopher that works a lot with uh, anthropology on animism in order to, to, uh, to understand these things. So. Professor Wettlesen, thank you very much for uh, taking the time. I'm a little bit starstruck <laughs> by <laughs> having you on this channel. Uh, so, uh, uh, but um, yes, before we get to um, to um, uh, my questions, uh, could you outline a little bit to people what actually what you actually mean by panpsychism and and yeah, why, why is that important? I know it's a big question, but... Um. Yeah, yeah as, as you say, Rune, I am a philosopher, but I also studied social anthropology and, and sociology. Uh, so uh, anthropology in particular has sort of always accompanied my, my thinking and my, my writing. Um, so I... I guess I ha had a kind of ecological turn in my work some 10, 15 years ago. Um, and I didn't then immediately turn to panpsychism. So that has been more of a gradual development coming to that topic. But as you say in, in my book from 2019, Cosmologies of the Anthropocene. I write about animism and, and panpsychism. Uh, so, panpsychism, uh, just to try and give a definition of, of the term. Um, also, pan, of course, means everything, uh, all. So, psychism refers to some some property some ability to experience or to respond or to relate in some way to ongoings in the environment to put it very crudely and pan signifies that at some perhaps very elementary level, this capacity to experience, to relate, to respond is to be found in everything that exists. Um, and that would then also logically include, um, yeah, for example, a stone. So uh, this goes all across the board, uh, sort of no longer heeding the traditional division or, or split between the animate and the inanimate, the organic and the inorganic. Uh, so it, it encompasses the entire also material world, if you like, uh, including stones. Um, and of course, this is um, an idea 
that is very old. And perhaps it's fair to say that um, it's not a prerogative of say some specific culture or some particular part of the world. So I, I think that this idea that let's say there is something psychic or something mental to be encountered in everything that exists, um, I, I think would be sort of one, of one of the oldest and most widespread ideas there is. So this, this, this is not uh, perhaps very, very far-fetched or, or, or surprising when you think about it, because uh, all across the board with, with you know, different religions and, and so on, we have, as long as there have been societies, groups of people, culture, mm, there has been cosmologies, there have been these this ideas, these thoughts, all of these questions about um, reality and sort of what, what, what makes of reality, what, what is the stuff of reality, uh, and then and, and seeking for, for some common denominator for everything that, that is real or qualifies as part of, of reality in its broadest sense. Uh, yeah, so just 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 to add perhaps a few things to that. Uh, so I say it, it's it's a very old idea, supposedly. Um, now in in philosophy, um, there has been in recent years a kind of renaissance of of interest in in panpsychism, and in in some ways that should be surprising. Uh, but then on the other hand, we, we often see a kind of dialectic also in, in various disciplines in uh, academia, uh, that there is this sort of swing in, in, um, in directions of in inquiry. And that, that when for some years, uh, very many scholars have sort of grouped around uh, one kind of approach or, or position, there will be a reaction to that and, and the pendulum sort of swings. You know, that's, that kind of phenomenon is, is familiar, of course. So um, panpsychism in, in philosophy is, is a very hot topic in philosophy of mind in particular and, and in metaphysics. And, uh, you know, in, in some sense, metaphysics was declared dead um say in 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 uh, positivism or uh, logical empiricism or or sort of in in, in a period uh, let's say uh, between first and second world war like in the, in the vienna school in in europe uh, uh, so so all of these questions about uh, sort of the character of, of reality were sort of dismissed as unscientific as uh, merely speculative uh, and, and sort of not, not to be worked on uh, by serious philosophers. Uh, yeah, so they're sort of excommunicated from, from, from uh, academia proper. Yeah, but um, also these days we have the problem of, of consciousness also ex explaining how there is this phenomenon of, of consciousness, that, that we are conscious beings, that we can relate uh, in our thought, um, that we can relate sort of cognitively, in intellectually to the environment. Um, and that we can also ab abstract from, from what is concretely present here and, and now. Uh, yeah, so that kind of, uh, you might say, advanced cognitive faculties have, of course, traditionally in, in the mess been limited to humans, human agents only. Uh, but there is then also this, this, this question now about have we sort of been correct in our assessment of various non-human beings, uh, such, as, such as animals? Uh, is uh, are, are we really talking about exclusively human capacities here? And uh, you know, of course, since since Darwin in his way and so on and so forth, um, 
this sort of received wisdom, at least since Descartes, of course, in the Western canon, has been very much questioned. So, so uh, the interest in, in panpsychism, also in philosophy or philosophy of mind these days, is, is to do with, with this project, you might say, which is, of course, very interdisciplinary, to expand this, this, this notion and, and indeed this, this sort of universe um, of agents from, from, from humans only to, to various others. And, and of course, at, at the very logical end of that expansion is even the inclusion of, of stones. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think it's um, uh, one thing I just want to uh, comment on what you were saying is the reject the rejection of specific forms of of, of thinking, which I think you say yeah. like uh, it's a main um, a really important train formative train in 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 European thinking, perhaps in all cultures that specific ways of thinking yeah. are pushed yeah. out. That is not us. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, but the uh, uh, in in Europe specifically, um, what has sometimes been coined under the label esotericism, yeah. uh, that is the uh, scholarship today. They talk about yeah. this as a a big waste bucket of all the rejected stuff, all the yeah. stuff that was put put out and and yeah. not us. Yeah. Uh, and for instance, uh, Bauder Hanegraaff, the important scholar of of uh, this rejection uh, history of rejection, he talks about uh, he talks about the, a defining feature of those cosmologies as what is what is the word he he uses now? What is the word? Who did you say? Bauder uh, Hanegraaff. Bauder okay. Hanegraaff. Yeah. Um, I, I, at this moment, I forgot the exact word that he used. Yeah. But how I understand it uh, from the animist language is that that these are cosmologies that operate with a, a continuum between uh, materiality and uh, divine div divinity. That these yeah. things can yeah. very much be in contact with each other, and yeah. that that is at least one defining feature of all those ways of understanding that was sort of pushed out of the, the normative ways of thinking. Yeah. And I, I, I've been thinking often that, that in fact, those ways of understanding the world that we normally understand as esoteric, that, that there's something about them which is uh, has aspects of animism, really. Yeah. Um, yes, that, that was just a a small thought uh, on on your your idea of rejecting these ways of thinking. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Uh, and of course, it's super interesting that that the academy then you could say reaches a point where where all of a sudden it seems that we are learning from the Achuar and the Runa uh, and, and the Yanomama. You know that is. It, it, it seems to me to be, but maybe you have a better perspective on this, but it seems to me a very long yeah. swing yeah. of the yeah. pendulum, that, yeah. that, like perhaps even back yeah. to, I don't know, ancient Greece or something like that, yeah. where we actually start learning. Yeah, from of course, this, uh, this, this, this very much divides uh, philosophers, but because... Uh, yes, you, you are right through that, that some of us like, like me are are indeed intellectually intrigued by, by uh, say, cosmologies of indigenous peoples today, like the, like the Runa in, in Ecuador and the Yanomami in, in the Brazilian Amazon and, and, and so on, also very much to do with, with South or Latin America often, uh, and, and known to us from, from anthropologists' work and ethnographic studies. But I also have, you know, colleagues who, who really uh, oppose uh, that there should be anything really worthwhile uh, to engage with there. So, so this dismissal, this re rejection that we have been talking about as a sort of historical fact uh, also remains uh, very much in, in, in operation uh, as it were in, in, 
uh, against large large portions of of academia. So 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 we are not talking about a kind of a total uh, uh, change here in, in in views about this, but in in some quarters and and perhaps I I could say something. Uh, perhaps anticipating things a bit, uh, if that's okay, Rune. That that oh. also for for me, um, even though I am a philosopher, uh, my my interest in in this constellation animism panpsychism um, is very much to do with with my sort of having turned myself into an environmental philosopher the last last ten years, like I said, and it's it's very much to do with sort of. For lack of a better word, practice. Also, not 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 really the intellectual thing. Uh, also, but but practice. Also, we have in 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 the West and also more and more uh, in the wake of globalization, like the last thirty years, also on, on a global scale, um, we have acted upon. As I, as I also fancy saying, we have acted upon. A certain set of ideas, and and these are are the ideas that are still are sort of um, handed down to us in in, in an anthropocentric framework, uh, very much from from Descartes and 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 his dualism, mind matter, uh, animate uh, inanimate, and so on, dualism, which, which is still a very strong legacy, not only intellectually or in the academia, uh, but but that we have acted upon those notions about those those divisions subjects objects and so on and so forth and 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 what we see today is is very much the consequences of of having acted upon those divisions those notions having done so sort of more and more effectively in a way by way of technologies and by way of the sort of spread uh, of this way of looking at the world by way of globalization and and we and we see that the, the the results in in many ways in what is also then sort of habitually uh, cherished as, as as progress uh the re results are are disastrous the results are disastrous they are not about progression or or about creation they are about degradation and destruction and, and that, yep. that's that, that's where we are today i think that's an awesome point that that uh the uh Cartesian naturalist uh, uh, ontology, or that the 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 uh, for if we can if I call that the idea of the dead exterior world, that yeah. is a doing. It is yeah. something that we do to the world. Yeah. It's and, it's not the mental thing. It's, no. it's it's out there in our practices. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and uh, and if that is the idea of the dead world, then it actually kills the world. It makes yeah. the world dead. Uh, I, I think that's 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 really uh, really important uh, really important point, and this is also of course um, it does uh, preface uh, another thing uh, that that I think I would get back to, which is a little bit about then how, what kinds of practices do we then create in order to to uh, give give life back to the world uh, yeah. but let me just um yeah. let me just preface that uh, uh with a little bit of um uh, a background from your your thinking here um you talk about in in your book here about uh a bond or contract uh between humanity and the world i guess uh i I'm not a philosopher, so sometimes my my language might uh, appear to you to be imprecise. Uh, I'm an anthropologist. I know how to play voodoo drums and do these kind of things. <laughs> um, but um, uh, and you talk about this breaking of a family tie, uh, and I think uh, uh, this is, of course, related to what what you just uh, talked about this idea of the dead exterior world that is a the the uh, the breaking you also talk about uh, cartesian naturalism as an unenlightened myth and i this this idea uh, of 
a myth being enlightened is one that I'm both a little bit cur curious about, but also I, I, I kind of like it. Uh, it. It has a little bit of a trickstery uh, yeah. idea uh, yeah. touched to me, this idea that because th there's a bit of an imp implicit idea in there that you, you mm. were suggesting, well, perhaps yeah. we should tell enlightened yeah. mythology. Yeah. Uh, and and that is that that is my my primary my uh, first first question is yeah. I have a lot of thoughts about this myself because yeah. in a sense I feel that that is what I'm trying to do <laughs> like yeah. spin mythology suggest yeah. narratives um, but uh, but 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 what 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 is your take on that can we create enlightened myths how do we how do we get about to do that and mm. do you know an example for instance of an, mm. an enlightened myths that mm. would heal that broken contract between mm. human communities and and uh, for instance what is sometimes called nature um, yeah yeah uh, okay so um as you say this 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 is a very wide-ranging questions so uh also with, with this formulation and and like myth i i want to sort of tease i want to provoke uh, i want to critically question how enlightened we are in in this western tradition going back to cartesian dualism uh, and in in putting it like that and and in seeking for sort of this 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 double bind or or or, or paradox or, or or whatever this tension between myth and enlightenment okay and sort of being being twins being two sides of the same coin you cannot have the one without having some influence of of the other even if sought repressed uh, of course, this 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 very much echoes the work Dialectic of Enlightenment by by the Frankfurt philosophers uh, Horkheimer and Adorno, uh, a, a book that has been very very influential, say in in the whole whole sort of post sixty eight uh, thinking in in, um, uh, in 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 the West. Okay, so um, yeah, how how to get at this also one one thing is 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 knowledge um if if, if we have this kind of self image in, in in the modern west that that we are an enlightened culture uh that we always seek to advance um knowledge uh sort of the more knowledge the uh, the better foundation we have for our practices and and, and whatever uh, so, so knowledge is always sort of a positive, always sought for. Uh, then, then of course, uh, when you start looking into that, uh, that that that's a sort of a myth. This this self image, because what has happened is is that some some sorts of of knowledge have been disqualified, like I said, as unscientific, merely speculative. Um, uh, occult and, and, and superstition uh, and faith and and so on. Uh, so there has been uh, in reality a, a sort of narrowing of what qualifies as 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 knowledge. And and this one way of putting this is is uh, worked out by by the philosopher Hans Jonas that that um, also method has sort of gained primacy over subject matter or substance. Uh, or that epistemology has gained primacy over ontology. Of course, these are difficult philosophical terms that I'm using now, but but uh, to explain it, it's 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 about um, only admitting uh, reality to uh, what we can know by way of certain methods or or certain criteria. Yeah, so there you have the sort of primacy. Uh, if if some phenomena um, um, sort of do not qualify as real, in the sense that they sort of fulfill these these criteria, criteria which are very much to do with with with, with what is quantifiable, what is observable, 
phenomenon that can be repeated in the same manner uh, at, at various times and places uh, to, to various observers and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, so, so only if, if they sort of uh, fulfill all of those criteria, then they qualify as really real, as, as, as sort of data. That, that can be studied scientifically and, and seriously. So th that's what I'm talking about here. So there has been an enormous narrowing of, of knowledge sort of in, in the name and in the epoch that hails knowledge. And, and that, that's, the, that's a paradox, if, if you like, okay? Yeah, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, okay. Cool. And um, no, I think these are uh, these are really good points. Uh, 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 the epistemology over ontology, uh, and like for instance, the quantifiability as a criteria for ontology is actually yeah. a very weird thing because numbers yeah. doesn't exist. Or yeah. right, they no, they, it, they it's are. Like, it's like saying that the most abstract. Yeah. Is, is the concrete in a way it's yeah. it's, it's kind of turning turning tables turning yeah. up, upwards down yeah yeah, yeah. And, and and it's amazing it's an amazing point you're making that the in in an age that seems to have an extreme valorization of knowledge yeah. knowledge is really being narrowed yeah uh i think this might also uh there might also be something about how we um how we uh, uh think about knowledge as accessibility we tend to think about um knowledge as uh, as something that is supposed to disseminate as much as possible yeah. knowledge must just flow as far as possible as quick as possible as yeah. absolute as possible yeah. in its spread where yeah. if you for instance go to animist cultures you often find forms of knowledge that whose dissemination is being very tightly controlled and yeah. some knowledge need to be yeah. uh for instance some knowledge can be very can be place based it can only yeah. exist in relation to a specific place or yeah. it can be relational between relational bound yeah. between different groups of humans um yeah cool but um but just to return to my question uh, when we think about spinning uh spinning enlightened myths then of course we should we should shift the perspective from epistemology and over to uh to uh ontology yeah. we should shift the perspective from the interpretation of the landscape as yeah. culturally imbued with beings to yeah. the cultural nature uh or the cultural community of the land landscape as being the ontological having an ontological primacy right yeah yeah I'm, I'm just kind of speculating with a little bit on yeah. with what you're saying there yeah yeah also uh, it's it's important what what you say about place also that that knowledge and and we see this very much in in uh, indigenous cultures and and cosmologies also knowledge is precisely not abstract it's precisely not sort of some commodity that can be transported from one time and place to the to the next and irrespective of, of observers and subjects agents involved and so on and so forth so so in a way it's it's the complete opposite that that knowledge is tied to place and and this also gives the primacy of course to telling stories also telling stories about what happened to those persons encountering those animals at that place some time long ago. And there is also this notion that that sort of the memory of the event, also events involving many sort of agents, not only humans, that this memory um, sort of resides in, in, in the place. Uh, so, so also a, a place, uh, you know, a, a river, or, or 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 landscape or or, or trees or, or or whatever that is sort of for us simply parts of the environment uh, that, that these also are sort of low key uh, of, of of agency of course and also of of, of memory uh, so this makes for this this sort of bond that you mentioned uh, previously also that that 
um, that that sort of like Hans Jonas again would say that um, everything that that humans encounter uh, is perceived as alive uh, is is perceived as as sort of spirited or or embodied in in soul. Also, there there is this uh, the all of this shared. Uh, features between humans and all sort of other beings being encountered. Uh, and then there is the fascination, of course, with, with, with different differences. Also that for sure, differences in, in properties of, of movement. Also some, also some animals, they, they will swim or, or they will fly and humans will, will, will walk and so on. And, and these differences are, are very fascinating. But, but there is this idea also that, that perhaps at, at the very beginning, humans were animals or animals were humans, or perhaps where humans die, we again become animals and so on and so forth. Also metamorphosis, you know, also transformations. Uh, and, and, and this is uh, something, of course, that, that very much opposes this dualistic thinking where um, sort of the, the entities are, are static in a way. So either you are something that is living or, or it's dead matter and so on. So either the one or, or the other. But, but we see in this, this fluidity here that, that, that as a reality is, is about process. Reality is not something static. Uh, and when you look for properties that, that sort of are static in the sense that they are uh, sort of always uh, one and the same, and then you can identify finding the same in a different time and, and space, that's, that's a completely sort of wrong-headed way of approaching reality according to these cosmologies. Awesome. Uh, I, uh, this particular thing with the tie between animals and humans is some that is something that I've thought a bit about uh, myself and 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 try to to work a little bit into being. And I think it might be an important point in popularizing uh, mm -hmm. animist cosmologies. Yeah. Um, one uh, one particularly I think beautiful example is if you move a little bit up into Scandinavia, uh, a lot of people have this idea. Uh, could be called totemic that bears are relations to human they are family yeah. and um, uh, particularly in in sweden i'm, I'm i know uh, a guy who studies that stuff and yeah. for instance they have this idea so they ritualize by for instance when people get married then yeah. the bridegroom will dress up in a bear costume yeah. and his best men would hunt him yeah. And then they would actually uh, uh, take the human being out of the bear. Uh, yeah. So they, they, they take his yeah. skin off as if they killed a bear. And yeah. so they, they, there's this exactly metamorphosis that, yeah. that very, very strongly inscribes mm. humanity with, yeah. uh, in this case, uh, a particular animal in, in, this, uh, yeah. in this area. And when, when you look at this particular stuff, it, it like it looks astonishingly indigenous when you consider the fact that you yeah. know it's 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 people in Herja Dolan in, in yeah. Sweden uh, yeah. who, who are doing that stuff yeah. uh, and like astonishingly indigenous we're talking about bear dances and yeah. wearing bear masks yeah. and they, I, I, yeah. I, I i'm not sure how much of it has continued up to the time where we are sitting now but it has it it was there in the 20th century yeah. and, i think that's that's interesting that that uh, also, animals like bear, they they are kin, as they would say in in anthropology. They are kin, uh, and uh, again, uh, we shouldn't talk about this as a sort of esoteric in the sense that this is to be found like in in in, in the Amazon. Also, mm -hmm. again, it's it's important that you point out to you know, that that we have this uh, notion also, and we have practices, rituals, and so on of the same kind, also in the Nordic countries. What has happened here, of course, is that at some point in countries like Norway and Sweden, uh, these notions and, and these practices and, and these rituals were seen as superstition. So they were sort of, they, 
they then had to sort of become subterranean or, or they were kind of, kind of subculture uh, existing in, in, um, in a very sort of troubling, uncomfortable way, sort of in parallel to, to the sort of official knowledge paradigm uh, to do with science and, uh, and so on. So uh, I know in, um, also in, in the Sami, people you know which is the in, in indigenous culture in, in, in Norway with, with the reindeer uh, lifestyle in, in the north in in, in Finnmark. Um, on, on the radio there was a couple of years ago a Sami person uh, pretty old like in his 70s uh, and, and the story he told was that um, he uh, still wants to sort of retain some of the rituals that he know that his parents, grandfathers, and so on and so forth, um, very much practiced. Uh, and, and previously at, at times where it was a kind of of, of tolerance, at least among the Sami, for, for having these notions and, and taking part in, in these rituals. Whereas nowadays, what, what this Sami man now tells is that he has to do these rituals now alone and as it were in secrecy. Also, there is a kind of, of cultural taboo uh, which he also talks about uh, is not only, say, in, in, in the majority culture, um, but also a, a kind of taboo that at least for a period has very much, has to at some, some large extent been sort of internalized also among these indigenous peoples themselves. Uh, but, but there is a kind of shift uh, these days, which perhaps you also can can att attest to Rune in, in your work, uh, also that that there is a kind of of pride. I see this in 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 young Sami people in Norway, also teenager or people in the, in their twenties, that generation. Uh, they are proud of being Sami, and and they really sort of exhibit this in 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 their in their clothing, in in, in their manners, in their beliefs, and so on also increasingly in, in, in the Norwegian wider public sphere. Uh, I think that this is, um, this is very promising and, and significant that, that we have this shift in, 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 uh, in the course of only two, two generations. Definitely. That I, what I feel that I'm seeing is an enormous global uh, shift towards uh, what you could call animist uh, ways of perceiving the world which today would then be encased in what we label tend to label religion and this this uh, this also happens in in a situation in in parts of the world where precisely these cultures are in a very precarious position <laughs> also you have this phenomenon that that there is this new pride in being indigenous uh, such and such at precisely a moment when this culture sort of as as a way of life is immensely threatened. Yes. At that yeah. very moment. Yeah. 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 Very much. Yeah. And uh, th that could perhaps parallel some of what we've seen with with uh, like folkloric collection of data in our own uh, yeah. uh, North European setting that a yeah. lot of the, the folklore knowledge was yeah. collected at the last yeah. Yeah. moment when it was yeah. still there. It's, it's happening in a situation of sort of disappearance and loss. Yeah. 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 So there is this, this very much this urgency to it. Yes. Yes, very much. Yeah. I And I think I think with this, this particular trend i think it's important to um sort of be aware or be wary of the role of nostalgia what yeah. that can do to us because yeah. if, if you look at something like romanticism um yeah. you remember the the very famous uh image uh wander über dem nebenmeer i think it's called nebelmeer yeah. uh, it is it is such an image of loss it's such yeah. an image of 
distance. It's yeah. such an image, actually, of the broken contract with that landscape that yeah. this wanderer is so detached from in his yeah. immaculate suit, aesthetically yeah. admiring it. Yeah. And, and I think that is such a, uh, it's such an ex expression of, you could say, a longing for that connection, but it just ends up in a nostalgic mode somehow, yeah. which yeah. it might do something good, but but yeah. it, but it 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 mu it must also get out, I think, from being nostalgia because it yeah. that it is a wallowing in this longing for that thing which yeah. is lost rather than going out and recovering it. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, are, you, are what you are hinting at, uh, Rune, is it that this in in a, in a political sense, what you know call this nostalgia can also be a very dangerous thing. So that what you're saying? Uh, partly that's implied. That, yeah. uh, that's implied. Also, in the uh, sense of reactionary, or, or... yeah, or, or it can become applied in in uh, in stuff like, for instance, uh, production of uh, uh, nationalisms that yeah. are yeah. Uh, f fundamentally uh, yeah. have consequences that are very unkind uh, yeah. to and. Yeah. I suspect, but uh, that nationalisms in themselves. Uh, are very rooted actually in the modernist Cartesian uh, mm. ontology because mm. when we think about ourselves as say a Danish person and I have yeah. a Danishness inside yeah. me somewhere yeah. then that is not it's not a relation to bear for mm. instance mm. which mm. would be a totemic way of mm. building mm. self-image mm. mm. and I fundamentally think that yeah. a, a curing would mean shifting towards the totemic uh, yeah. or, or other kinds of landscape yeah. Connected. So, analysis. so you are saying that this this can be very much committed to this idea of us against them. Also, that 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 people who sort of have share identical features, or or some uh, common ancestry to to land territory going back a long time, that also makes for some entitlement to the land to the resources, and then all others sort of are are, are threatening this. Uh, so, so you, so you have this divide, which is very much part of modernity. Then, I, exactly. I think this, this is, this is also interesting from, say, a more <laughs> psychoanalytic point of view. Also, that that um, it, it's not really a sign of maturity, rather of immaturity. That that sort of one's identity, also as individuals in a group, should be so reliant upon sharedness, commonness, also identity in, 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 in that one dimensional sense with, with others, which makes all others again, different and sort of strangers, not one of us and, and so on. So because mature identity is, is really capable of combining, you know, what is shared, and what is different, and also seeing the value of, of what is different from me. Yeah. yeah, we could say that other is a potential for relating, and yeah. perhaps it's a necessity for relating. It's a precondition yeah. for relating. So, yeah. if you look at, uh, uh, I think um, uh, Vivero de Castro, uh, yeah. you probably know, uh, he he talks about uh, indigenous self images as being very much not identity focused yeah that these groups uh, yeah. among many amerindians yeah. they basically yeah. just refer to themselves as as persons uh, yeah. or they sometimes they even use uh, pejorities from a neighboring group so yeah. to, to refer yeah. to themselves so yeah. there's a, a whereas their focus uh, is on network of relating where the, the the human is inscribed in different totemic relation systems that that sort of uh, so it's a di so uh, I think it's a very different and probably much more as you say mature model yeah. of how to create human self-image yeah. than, yeah. than this the kind of there's a jar and it's defined yeah. by Danishness and we're all, yeah. all inside that jar yeah, yeah. Um, the network um, idea yeah cool let me let me just uh turn to another uh uh thing uh, in your thinking that i 
it, it, it's it's just that little point of de- defining animism as panpsychism in practice that I, I really, really love that point. Uh, also in relation to this particular mess of an ontology that 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 we've kind of succeeded in in making for ourselves i think that i think the point is overlooked actually uh, when for instance uh, bruno latour and and others uh, launched the suggestion that perhaps we ne- perhaps we never stopped being animists because we still shout at, at at our printer when it's dysfunctional just before the deadline and our journalists still talk about hurricanes and economic crises that are attacking a country, for instance, as if they yeah. had subjective agency and so on. Yeah. Um, when, when, when this point is made, I think that, that practice element is what I feel is kind of overlooked. I yeah. don't think that shouting at your printer is, pr- of course, it's a kind of practice, but I don't think it is practice enough to make you an animist. I think it's perhaps there's a residue of animism. Perhaps there's a panpsychist mm. aspect in mm. that thinking that underlies shouting at the printer, or perhaps yeah. uh, subconsciously underlies it. Yeah. Uh, if you offered the printer a glass of beer, or if you went on a shamanic voyage to recover the soul of the printer, that would yeah. be animist, right? Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, yeah. So I think this. And it follows from this importance of practice that practice actually has, I think, primacy to belief yeah. and to belief and thinking. Now, yeah. that means that if we have a, a, a like a common Scandinavian uh, a gnome, a Nissa Tomter being, yeah. uh, and we went and asked him, what would you like the best, that I walk around ontologically believing in your abstract existence or... Yeah. A ball of porridge. Yeah, <laughs> Nissa would want a bo- ball of porridge, right? Yeah. Because that yeah. is the that is the the the, pra- the concrete practice in that realizes that subjective, uh, right? Yeah. And yeah, and and that that is that is why a lot of what I do, I'm I'm sort of trying to get out of thinking, talking space, and into actually doing stuff. But I would really like yeah. to hear what you. Yeah. If you have any thoughts about that, how do we yeah. how do we begin mm. changing our practice? Because if we should follow up yeah. on this thought, then we should practice first and then believe. Well, it doesn't even really matter if, mm. if we tr- treat the world like persons. Then then we're almost already there. Almost, yeah. it, it doesn't make sense what I'm saying. Again, it's it's a very it's a very big big question. Um, yeah, I. Let's let's start by saying this. Also, I I I sort of fancy making a distinction that may sound old-fashioned, if not obsolete, to many today. Uh, namely, the Aristotelian one between the grown and and the made. Uh, so why why is this relevant here to your question i i think that for me animism the way i understand it from from the anthropological literature is is that it's 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 to do with responding also there you have the practice bit not thinking about but responding in, in, in all sorts of encounters um, with animals, but also with sort of other grown things like trees, like, like rivers, or even in holes, also places made up of all of these, okay, places, um, relating uh, to, to places being made up of various uh, sort of grown things, just to use that word, um, in a way that that respects all of these as subjects, as as agents, persons, uh, basically like myself, also with some uh, different capacities for for movement and so on. Like I said before, uh, but still, as a basically to be respected uh, in a kind of reciprocity, in in a kind of of, um, give and take, you know, um, 
being able to respond to me like I should respond to them. Uh, so then you also have a very sort of large, inclusive, if you like, moral universe where also in, in hunting, um, the animals are really seen and treated as, as the superior party to, to the human hunters. In, in that, that, that the human hunters have this, this recognition that, that we are the ones sort of dependent upon, at, at the mercy of the animals, uh, giving themselves up to us as, as, as a gift to what is to them their inferior party, uh, as it were. But, but where the idea, of course, is that there should be limits, precisely because of this duty to show respect limits to what you can hunt, when you can hunt, uh, how much, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, so so that's the one thing. And, and now, what then about things that are made as opposed to grown? Uh, so I sometimes I, I say that uh, one of the problems with our society today in the modern West is that we are not materialist enough and when i say that people are very surprised uh, because they were expecting from from a cultural critic like me that i should say that materialism is is all too much materialism is is the problem no i 100 percent I... agree with you on that <laughs> so what 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 do i mean uh so so what do i mean or what do we we mean rune by by saying this we we mean or i mean that um we have this this waste. Also, we, we we dispose of things. We have the, we have this ever increasing turnover in 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 buying things and and then uh, throwing them away, replacing them by the newest model and and all of this. Also, what makes sort of capitalism work from one day to the next? Okay, in our role as as consumers. So, uh, if you sort of put that into perspective within a wider concept here of of materialism, one could say that. One of the many reasons why we should be critical of, of this uh, waste and, and disposal and turnover society that we are part of as consumers is that we are not showing the made things the respect that they deserve. And of course, it, it doesn't make the same sort of sense to talk about this respect for, for all kinds of, of sort of stuff, if you like to use that word, made stuff. That 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 doesn't make sense sort of indiscriminately all across the world. But 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 the point is that I think also in Scandinavia, like only two or three generations ago, uh, we would have say grandparents who had a lot of skills, competence to do with repairing things when they broke down and there was a kind of bond to use that word again say between the people and 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 and, and the furniture the furniture in my living room i i would have you know taken over from my parents who had taken it over from their parents and so on so so there was this this kind of importance also in in showing uh sort of um my my previous family respect in taking care of um, what what they had uh, you know perhaps often built or 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 purchased or or had had uh, in use so there is this bond in the way we humans also use like um like my table or or my chair here or or my stereo equipment that I bought 50 years ago and so on. So I, I very much always, uh, before I got interested in this topic, say in, in a sort of intellectual way, I, I always from my childhood uh, had, I guess from my parents and grandparents, this, this pride in, 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 in preserving things, seeing to it that, that they can, that we can still use them. That's the one, we can still use them. There is no, no point in in throwing them away and and replacing them. And I think that it's 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 a kind of tragedy in in a way because this what I'm saying here is is kind of 
common sense or or instinctive. I think in many ways it's it's, it's a very deep rooted phenomenon. I think perhaps especially like in uh, in a family that I take care of of the things that my parents used and so on. So so we have this as as a kind of instinctive thing, but but the thing is is that modern capitalism has been so dependent on sort of countering this or marginalizing this or 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 making fun of it or, or whatever way you want to put it. Uh, so I uh, also again I would say that we also in the Nordic countries have important uh, cultural resources. It's 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 so much to be learned about practices that 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 uh, they had a few generations and it's not to say that everything was better in the past we had lots of discrimination like between men and women and and all of that i know about all of that uh, but but when it comes to, to this phenomenon that we are talking about with, with bonds bonds with animals bonding with the natural world bonding with with things uh, I think there is a, a lot, a lot to sort of be gained by en for, from engaging with with how this was done, in, indeed quite recently, also in the Nordic countries. Although it may feel very distant to many people today, it's it's quite recently that we had a lot of this. I think it's uh, there are several uh, very good points in what you you are saying, like super important. This thing that, um, if I should just like reflect a little bit on what you're saying, that the consumerist system is actually anti-materialist. It is a degrading of yeah. objects. That yeah. means that we buy a, a, uh, a smartphone, for instance, yeah. and we have it on our body every day. We, we interact so much with it, but when it's gone, it's just thrown out. And yeah. it represents a, a, a te technological yeah. skill, and which is yeah. almost unimaginable. It's, it's disrespectful, and it's yeah. also demeaning us as agents in being so disrespectful of so many things. Yes, yes, and the and and the the exactly the uh, the relation that that people had just just a couple of generation ago ago I think is a wonderful image furniture that like uh, and 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 this also has to do with the, this well I think economically it probably has to do with this hectic escalation yeah. in consumption and economy we are so unfathomably wealthy just yeah. compared to how it was in the 1980s or 70s and yeah. and the the uh and the idea that and and we we can also see it in in the objects around us like i grew up in a farm uh in in, in jutland some of the objects that are from the early to mid 20th century they're still there and they're yeah. still functional yeah uh and but uh yeah. and, and that's because people were or they had a little bit yeah. more materialism yeah. in their way of relating yeah, they to made objects. things in order that they endure that yeah, they love exactly exactly yeah. and they may and that's and there's a respect in that and there yeah. is a uh, perhaps philosophically uh, there's even a dwelling in that yeah. object yeah. from that human skill and attention that goes into yeah. making a cupboard uh, that is so good that it, it holds for four generation uh, yeah. you know uh, yeah. No, I think it's an absolutely, uh, absolutely wonderful and central point to to how our whole uh, society uh, is, uh, is is become destructive to the world, and that that is in our close relation to 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 the objects that we interact with every single day, probably. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Rune, I I have to. I think end it. Uh, Thank you very much to Professor uh, Arne Johan Vettersen for <laughs> giving me another uh, another audience. Do you say audience when you meet a real professor of philosophy? I think you probably do. Um, <laughs> it sounds but, a bit old fashioned. It does. It does. <laughs> um, but um, uh, for then for granting me some time because uh, we our super interesting discussion last week uh, there was actually a couple of of more questions that I yeah. would have really liked to to air air with you and, and hear what you you thought about um, the first one 
uh, actually requires a little bit of explanation. And this is connected to the discussion or the, the dialogue that reflection that you're leading in your in your book with Tim Ingold about reversing uh, what you call the order of ontological primacy, so that instead of assuming the reality or the landscape that we that we are in as a dead exterior. Uh, that we then come and implement personification or culture or whatever on it, then that order should actually be reversed. So that, as I understand what you're saying, that we primarily experience or encounter or engage or exchange with someone in our being in the world rather than navigating or observing a something. Right, so that the that the the community of beings that we interact with become the basis. Now, I totally agree with this uh, idea. However, uh, there's a small reflection or caveat about it, which I derive from my own study of uh, contemporary Afro-diasporic forms of animism that have grown in very close encounter with modernity. Uh, that is, for instance, stuff like voodoo in Haiti, or uh, what I've studied myself, the Afro-Brazilian uh, uh, candomblé, which is also a religion. Now, in those ways of engaging the world, a bit like in, in, in their West African roots, there is actually a considerable focus on the human agency. Gods, for instance, they become themselves when humans enculturate them, actually. And when you speak, for instance, to people from West Africa, and you ask them, how, how, how does spirits work? Then they almost invariably will, will tell you something like, well, you take any object, like something standing on the table in front of you, and then you start performing rituals on it. And then a spirit will move into that object. And this is a almost a, a constructivist, actually, perception of, of reality. People uh they these the, these kind of cultures they seem to operate with for instance gods and spirits even cosmocratic deities like the ones we know from the pre-christian nordic or roman religion um uh that this is something that humans also to quite like quite a lot of an extent bring into being uh, for instance, they conceptualize deities as children that priesthoods teach how to, to act. Um, you also find this in our own uh, North European animism, where, for instance, a farmer is walking home and then he meets a subterranean spirit or something like that, a little people. He invites it home to live on his farm and become sort of a patron spirit, a Nissa Tomta being on his farm. Uh, notice the similarity with the West African who's saying, well, the, the spirit is moving in to that place when I invite it somehow. And my intuition is that this human participation in the, the dwelling might be more relevant in in contexts that are um, that have uh, uh, more encounter with the modern ontology, uh, it's more counter modern that it's non modern, perhaps. But that's only like speculating a bit. And I, I, I would speculate that perhaps if you go visit people that are rather non modern, uh, or lean more non-modern, the Yanomama or something like that, then perhaps their ontology, which leans to more towards um, uh, just perceiving the spirit world as, as already dwelling in the landscape, right? But I also think there's a bit of a hope in there that our the omnicidal attack on all life from our civilization is not sort of the, the it's not the end point we our culture may have been subjected to some sort of animist lobotomy or something like that but that can actually be changed because human agency sort of plays a role and yes okay so th there's a little bit of a long <laughs> introduction to a question but I'm, I'm sort of interested in how do we perhaps reconcile or bring into dialogue this idea of reversing 
the uh, the the uh, ontological primacy and this idea of human agency in the inviting. Is my no. question clear? Uh, it, it's a complex question because I see at least two dimensions to it or, or two ways of approaching it. So, so so the first way of approaching it, I guess, is, is the one that we discussed last time, also the, the typical philosophical one to do with the relationship between ontology and epistemology. So, so, so there I, I, I voice this, this criticism that is, of course, well known that in, in, in recent Western history and, and philosophy, we have this primacy or the question of what we know or what we can know over that of being, as it were. And, and it may, this may lead to skepticism and, and solipsism and, and sort of this search for, for evidence that there are other minds that there is a physical world existing independently of me out there and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, so I, I think that m much of this is is sort of a dead end. So yeah, so if you if you look at it then historically um, and and give examples from different cultures and different parts of the world and different epochs, uh, like you do know, uh, Rune, uh, you will see, as you mentioned, that in, in many instances, uh, the role of, of humans or human agency uh, will be very crucial. Uh, like you say, that, 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 that humans have, have a role in sort of inviting the spirits in. Uh, also that, that sort of spirits join humans be it in in a sort of ritual or or whatever in some in some cultural way okay so so there is that role of humans in inviting uh, the spirits um yeah let, let, let me let me mention uh also david Kopenawa. he he is this this you know well-known chief among the uh, yanomami in the brazilian uh Amazon and, and he has this book, The Falling Sky, uh, with the anthropologist Bruce Albert, which came out in, in 2013. Uh, so so Copenhava is, is describing um, the Amazon forest um, as a sort of site of, 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 of so many types of spirits so so the forest is is the home of of various spirits and uh, and the role of 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 human persons there uh, is to respect these spirits in in all their guises in all their forms of of being um, as it were so as not to disrespect them so as not to uh, trespass to overstep limits and so on and so forth so there is also this kind of normative or or, or moral tinge to that in 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 showing humility humility and, and gratitude and and so on and and as always as, as a warning of human arrogance and, and hubris uh, which will always be be punished uh, okay so um I think that it's it's a very sort of Western um, modern notion that for anything of uh, a kind of spiritual uh, nature to exist, we um, we need some some act of acknowledging or or, or 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 testifying to that spirit as something real as as existing um, by way of human subjects um, so um, 
I, I think that in, in, in of course, the, what we call non-modern cultures or life forms will vary very much among themselves. So they are a heterogeneous category and not, not a homogeneous one, of course. But I think that in, in say, the, the older ones uh, that we know about, um, like I mentioned, last time when we spoke, there, there will be this, this notion that um, there is no kind of either or um, relationship or order of being between humans and say, say animals. So, so it's about fluctuation. It's, it's about um, having kind of some residence in, in both and then with by way of metamorphosis, also transforming from from the one to to the other, and and I think that this is this 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 um, sort of captures that that kind of ontology that uh, also uh, things that exist the world uh, that exists uh, is 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 dynamic. It's uh, also any any given moment on any particular place. Uh, what will be manifest there will be sort of the result, the manifestation of the interplay of so many sorts of beings. Uh, none of you or none of you whom should be seen as um, more important or more original or primordial than the rest. So, so, so it's all about um, this this richness uh, of different sorts of. Of beings and of course also influencing each other making a into what a is thanks to this interplay with, with b and c and so on so um, um i don't know if if this really catch if this really sort of responds uh to what you said but i i, I also for me What's, what's fascinating about this sort of non-modern cultures uh, is that there is this, this, this keen awareness of there not only being other kind of agents or agencies than the human ones that, that matter, uh, but that also our own human agency uh, very much depends on uh, the continued thriving and blossoming, flourishing of that of all, of all others. Thank you very much for that. I, I think also the, um, no, there's a, there's a number of notes in what you're saying that I think are really important. Uh, one of them uh, is anthropocentrism, where the, uh, I have sometimes been asking myself whether it is actually whether animist cosmologies can actually be said to not be anthropocentric. You sometimes have the idea, for instance, of humanity as the custodial species, as that species whose yeah. task perhaps it is to yeah. sort of make sure that, that everything doesn't go away, or yeah. you even have idea of, of humanity as like, in ancient Greece, there's a huge human standing in the middle, holding, holding the heavens, as if it's humanity that sort of pulls the cosmos apart. Yeah. Um, or, or in in Amazonian perspectivism, this idea that it's almost as if the the howler monkeys are perhaps humans that disguise yeah. themselves as howler monkeys when we encounter them. Yeah. Of course, they would perhaps perceive us as howler monkeys that disguise yeah. ourselves as humans. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but there is a, a, uh, a and 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 this role of the human is yeah. yeah I think it's a re it's a really difficult question when we yeah. are talking about um, uh, um, kind of reversing the ontological yeah. primacy. Yeah. Um, uh, but it seems to me that uh, that uh, you mentioned two concepts that uh, that are really important. Uh, one of them is the encounter, uh, the idea of of engaging with the world as an encounter, um, and the other one is metamorphosis. Uh, 
the, yeah. the idea that we are uh, we are perhaps all transformational beings somehow. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think that's very, uh, very central, central ideas. Yeah. Um, cool. Um, and then I actually have one, uh, one uh, last question here, uh, which is, it's about those ideological structures that are common in our day and age and that have become perhaps normative or very popular and i'm sort of continuously struggling a little bit with understanding their role and figuring out how to be critical of them or perhaps not critical of them um i, I have particularly you know <laughs> elected nationalism to be the beast in my revelation i'm yeah. critical of nationalism yeah. uh, but there's also stuff like christianity uh, which is is a very defining worldview in in um uh, yeah. in western culture um yeah. i tend to be a little bit less critical of christianity uh, b but i also do have some points of 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 criticism but my my question is like when we are talking about the cultural changes that should perhaps occur as we enter into a more respectful ways of being in the world, what what would you think that we should actually, how would you think we should deal with um, systems of thinking such as nationalism and Christianity uh, that define our culture to such an enormous extent and have an enormous popular reach how should we manage them should we change them should we discard them what what, what would you think about these the these kind of of yeah ways of thinking yeah also why why you're asking this question is is that because we we know that both christianity and nationalism have played a problematic role in sort of helping cause, helping even sort of reinforce the kinds of crisis that that we're in today. And then we mostly talk about uh, the, the crisis, say, in, in the relationship between between humans and the rest of nature. That, yes. that's, that's the background for, for you're asking about this. Yes, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like yeah. one example would be yeah, that yeah. Christianity would tend to put the the interaction between humanity and yeah. perhaps something divine at a very distant point in the in the past yeah. jesus yeah. the life of jesus and that means yeah. that the close encounter yeah. perhaps is excluded that's just one example yeah yeah um again it's a very sort of broad wide-ranging question of of course in in this article by lynn white which is very famous from 1967 um, white decisively points to christianity as sort of the historical villain in 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 this story of of environmental degradation that that we are seeing um, today he points to christianity uh, and, and of course, to do with the, the supremacy, superiority alleged of, of humans over against the rest of, of nature. So that's that's a very well known story. I, I also there. I guess there's two 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 comments to that. One comment is that is this really fair to Christianity? Is is there not another way of of sort of being Christians or, or, or interpreting the Bible and the teaching of Jesus Christ and so on and so forth. Uh, also, to what extent is this role as, as a villain uh, simply to be uh, accepted on, on face value? Um, yeah, one could say that there is more to Christianity uh, than simply human supremacy and, and sort of justifying uh, humans' exploitation of, of of nature. So, so perhaps there is also another message, you know, uh, that say love of one's nature uh, neighbor sh should also uh, include love love of animals and and so on and so forth, and, and therefore it's not a, a purely human to human thing. 
Okay, so so of course we know that that, that there are readings of the Bible and and there are Christians who who very much would would then uh, criticize uh, that kind of an anthropocentrism that we know find so so problematic. So 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 that's one thing. And and historically, I I very much think that in 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 the West and and sort of in in the industrialized countries in today's world. Um, yeah, it, it's not that faith in, in say, a Christian God uh, no longer has a role to play. Uh, but um, that faith in that God um, is, is less important to, 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 to large portions of, of the population, uh, perhaps especially in, in Europe. Uh, it's 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 a bit different in in, in the United States uh, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so so we know that that religion plays plays a role like in like in India. We know that it plays a role in in Africa and, and so on and so forth. So so perhaps secularization uh, is is mostly a phenomenon that is sort of culturally socially important in terms of say cosmology in in modern europe and it shouldn't be generalized to the whole world um okay but um i i, I have never been very much attracted to this to this idea of 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 lynn white that 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 christianity really should be singled out as as a main villain here so um so, so that's one thing uh then uh, Runde, uh nationalism and um yeah, indeed, and, and sort of in, in continuation of the point I just made, uh, I think we do see a kind of renaissance for, for, for nationalism. And, and um, why do we see that? It, we, we can, of course, view that sort of dialectically, uh, that one way of explaining uh, this sort of reinforced role of, of nationalism, even, even in, in today's Europe, okay, today, uh, is, is to do exactly with, with say, um, the loss of Christian faith or, 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 or what has happened to religion in, in a secular age. Uh, so that is to say that, that nationalism uh, can play uh, for people much the same role that, say, Christian faith or, or some religious faith uh, could play earlier. Uh, also, so so that um, there there is a kind of sacredness to to my nation, uh, that my nation, the one I belong to, uh, making up this this particular we that is us, uh, has particular value as compared to other nations or other peoples, and so on and so forth. So so that you have this this notion of, of a kind of supremacy, that of course then can also be be used to. To, to justify uh, discrimination, aggression, even uh, come to it, war, as we have seen in many examples. And I don't know really if I, you know, I, I worked a lot with on what happened in Bosnia in the 1990s, and and, and nationalism is, is is sort of component there, but it's it's complex. So it's also to do with ethnicity and 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 and, and the history of, of former Yugoslavia and so on and so forth. So. So nationalism would would be one component in in a more complex uh, picture, but I guess what you're what you're getting at, Rune, in, in asking uh, this question is is also is it problematic, sort of per se, that we humans evidently have this 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 tendency, this this disposition, as it were, to mark borders between ourselves and others. It can be between us and others in the terms of, of animals and so on, but it can also be sort of the others as, as a different national or ethnic or religious group. Uh, so we have this, this tendency to, to mark such, such borders. And as we know, that is not simply some descriptive or neutral um, Exercise. It's 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 very normative. It's it's morally charged, with with those who are more worthy, and those who are less less worthy. 
Yeah, so I, I think that there is this position, this disposition that I, I take to be pretty universal if there is such a thing in humans. Um, to make a distinction between, say, us and them. And I think it would be a mistake and, and, and kind of naive to think that we can do away with any kind of distinction along the lines of there being us and them. That, that making that distinction, as it were, is, is a sort of root problem or, 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 or root evil, if you like. Um, I think that would be simplistic, and I think also uh, in, on some level it, it's uh, unrealistic, uh, unrealistic to sort of remove that. So, so the thing, of course, is to be able to to make that kind of distinction also in the future, uh, without it it being. Um, <laughs> At the end of the also lethal without it having this this kind of aggression to it, that if if you are in in the them category, rather than in 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 the us or we category, uh, then uh, negative consequences uh, follow from that. That's that's of course uh, uh, what many people will say that these these things are two sides of the same coin. If you make distinctions then there will inevitably be someone that is more worthy, less worthy, better and, and worse. There will be this kind of, of normative tinge to it. Um, but I, I, I don't think that that's, that's the right way of, of getting at it because for me very much the point in, in my recent books is that we must allow for differences. We must allow for all sorts of, of otherness and we cannot really say that making distinctions uh, along whatever lines is, is sort of the root problem. Uh, the, the challenge, the task is to look upon and sort of treat in practice uh, differences, distinctions um, as, as a kind of richness, as, as a kind of manifold uh, that, that we should be thankful for and, and that we also should, should see as sort of constituting who we are, who I am as, as a particular group or, or a particular individual. No, I, again, an absolutely wonderful point that, uh, that distinctions uh, are perhaps uh, as casting an other, they are perhaps a potential for relation, yeah. perhaps a potential for creative transgression uh, yeah. or these kind of things. Because um, of that we are different from each other is, is, is enriching. If we were yes. all alike, it would be simply boring. It, it would be a sort of status quo. It would get us nowhere. Yes, yes. I, I, I've actually had a bit of a debate uh, just recently with, oh, uh, just a little chat with a uh, um, misgendered uh, person, uh, what some would call a trans woman, uh, who, um, uh, and, and she, she, was, she, she was becoming really interested in this question of other and how, and, and how to deal with it. And this is, of course, a person who has experienced quite a lot of othering, but is then yeah. also reflecting on, is the answer then expanding normativity to not having any distinctions at all is that then the response and and i think uh, i think it's an incredibly uh, uh, relevant uh, question for our time um yeah I, I also think with nationalism i have been thinking that nationalism um uh, uh it perhaps uh, nationalism becomes particularly important to interrogate because nationalism is in many ways a, a child of modernity yeah. and it is linked with um romanticism which mm. in its nostalgia and all these things yeah. are responding yeah. to that rupture that we are talking about as a problem i think yeah. i don't think romanticism has a very good solution because i think mm. romanticism ends up just wallowing in the detachment and and kind of resting in the enjoyment of nostalgia yeah. or something like that yeah. rather yeah. than actually building a yeah. connection yeah. Uh, but this then gives nationalism this problematic uh aspect that it very much 
you could almost say leeches on cultural motives that are actually bent towards animism somehow. In, yeah. in Denmark, for instance, uh, our nationalism has been very focused on the motive of Vikings as yeah. pre-Christians. Yeah. Um, in Norway, uh, I think fo- my impression is that folklore, yeah. uh, folk costumes and these kind of things, which yeah. are, and these are different kinds of of, of pointers towards animist aspects of our cultural mm-hmm. heritage, which yeah. is then being sort of, I'm tempted to use the word appropriated into yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, internationalism, yeah. Uh, where, yeah. and and also with, mm-hmm. I, I've also been, been thinking that perhaps the problem of nationalism is that it, it creates this we by yeah. looking at an essence rather than looking yeah. at a, at, at yep. relations, yep. if if for instance we were bear yep. clans and raven clans, yep. then our self image would be built not on Danishness or Norwegianness, yep. but on a, on a landscape relation. So yep. there would probably still be wars, there would probably still be cruelty, there yep. would certainly still be distinctions. Yeah, but at least <laughs> we would be working in the direction of building self image on. Yeah. Uh, from an animist perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Um, let me also just mention with, with regards to uh, Christianity, that th- this is also something that I've been thinking about. And and I'm, I'm also, like you say, I'm also not particularly in love with the point that Christianity is supposed to be human supremacy uh, because Genesis Genesis chapter two is anthropocentric, yeah. um, uh, or can legitimately be read as anthropocentric. Uh, I think that that these world religions have an enormous capacity to redefine themselves and yeah. and, and and reflect on themselves yeah. in such various ways. Yeah. Um, one particular example is the Muslim mutasilla theology, which is actually immanentist. They as I understand, uh, they actually uh, thought about the world as to that extent inhabited by God, that science itself, natural science, was a sacred uh, sacred act of communing with God, because yeah. it was the, the, the yeah. study of materiality itself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I find that to be incredibly beautiful. Yeah, uh, um, yeah. yeah. Just to just to follow up on what you said, Rune, about about nationalism. That of course, if there is this idea of some some kind of eternal essence to do with what is genuine, authentic, and pure, then that that will very quickly be be exploited in the kind of discrimination, aggression that we talked about, so as to preserve this essence against all threats be they from inwards, be they come from, from outwards. So, so, so um, if, if you can have a kind of we identity that is proud of its distinctness in particularity and also sees the importance of, of others being particular, being distinct in their ways without feeling threatened by that, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's the vision that, that we need to favor. Very much. I totally. And there, I actually think that pragmatism can really serve as well, because mm-hmm. if you if we look at how people build identity in a country like uh, contemporary South Africa or I don't know, but but uh, contemporary Brazil, for instance, yeah. they see themselves as essentially mixed. And that yeah. is what they celebrate. Yeah. And. I actually feel that I've seen um, notes of that in in Norwegian um, uh, patriotism, that you have stuff like the king, he will go out and he will say that uh, that everybody is Norwegian. And that doesn't matter if your parents were from Somalia or if you were a girl who likes other girls and so on. Yeah, did you see this speech? (laughs) Yes, I saw it. I saw it. I think it went viral because the question the king asked is, who are Norwegians? And then his Norwegians are boys who likes girls, girls who likes boys, boys who likes boys, girls who likes girls, and so on and so on. Yeah, That's exactly. And 
uh, that I, I was actually thinking in that respect that with a pragmatist uh, way of looking at uh, contemporary society, the idea of monarchs might yeah. actually not be a bad idea because monarchies, they actually have this idea that the monarch, the monarch is affirmed by the plurality yeah. of uh, yeah. subjects. Yeah. So you see stuff like yeah. like the Queen of Denmark. She will wear Inuit national costume yeah. when she visit, visit the Greenlanders. Yeah. Now yeah. today, of course, that is a remnant of some imperial power language, of course, but it is also a way mm. of saying, yeah. in yeah. my capacity of mon yeah. monarch to you, yeah. I am also an Inuit. Yeah. Yeah. And that is a very inclusive, yeah. a very appreciative of otherness. Yeah. I think that's a very good point that that uh, monarchies that we have today, if they are to be sort of to endure into the future, they need to be very conscious about the positive role of plurality in their countries. Yeah, and I think I think democracies need to be aware of the, that way in which democracies tend to produce, for instance, the idea of the people as a sacred mm. essence, because yeah. democracies yeah. do have a little bit of that tendency. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I actually think that from a pragmatic position, the those of us who do have constitutional monarchies with us, yeah. we could actually yeah. employ this monarch, monarch role in a very, very progressive way in yeah. building societies. Yeah. Is yeah. it, it, like when I say yeah. this to my very leftist friends, they look at yeah. me as if yeah. I just yeah. drank mushrooms uh, tea. Or something. Yeah, the thing, the thing, <laughs> I, 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 I agree. I'm also very positive to to the constitutional monarchy that we have. But what we see, of course, is that it's very sort of person dependent. It hangs yeah. very much <clears throat> on, on the personalities that yeah. we are talking about here. Yeah, yeah. it yeah. could be solved by perhaps uh, inscribing. Uh, specific roles for the monarch in in mm. in, in the constitution, yeah. uh, but that would require <laughs> a, a a pretty uphill political struggle, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, cool, cool. Professor Arne Johan Wettersen, yeah, yeah. thank you very much okay. for uh, yeah. taking the time Thanks for, Thanks to for having uh, me. and um, uh, yes, um, yeah. it was very very inspiring. And uh, yeah. thank you very thank much. Thank you, Rune. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye. Bye. My name is Rune Jane Rasmus. The work that I'm sharing with you on this channel focuses on recovering Euro traditional animist knowledge. This is the fruit of a life of study and research all over the world. And I hold a doctorate from the oldest university in the Nordic region, but I'm choosing to popularize rather than to focus on academic publication. Conventional institutions, however, have yet to warm up properly to my perspective. So if you appreciate what I do, then please do consider that I also need to feed my family. Uh, for the price of less than one beer per month, you can become a patron supporter, or you can head over to my web shop and enter into exchange relation with me. You can also give single donations to my PayPal account, or if you have contact with someone that might help me project this incredibly important perspective to the world, then do drop me a PM. And uh, remember also to clickety-click and subscribe, follow, share, comment and all that. Thank you very much. Oh,